Uh, Bev, I think we're a long way uh, from the kind of fire exchange that I'm sure you have with many of your guests before, uh, before humans' time is done in the newsroom. So just how close are we to seeing AI re get really close to what a human is like? So the technology has come such a long way in the last few years. We had something called the Uncanny Valley, which is as these robots and artificial intelligences got more like humans, they looked really strange to us and they looked a bit quirky and they didn't look like they were alive. But we've now gotten to the point we've kind of passed that uncanny valley and now the deep fakes that people can create today um, that are used such as those newsreaders are very realistic and they're capable of uh, mimicking human behavior from a an astonishingly small amount of data so to give you an example i created a, a voice of obama and i was able to do that from three minutes of audio and it sounded exactly like him so, you know, I guess you've got Obama whose name and his, inter his, his, his voice and his intonation is very well known, but how far can that spread in terms of really mimicking it so well? Yes, yeah, so look, with just a few minutes of audio of anyone's voice and a bit longer of video, we are able to create these deep fakes and it takes less and less effort and less and less resources uh, and money than it used to in the past. So I think we're going to have to see some type of regulation for this. Obviously, this technology um, can be abused. Obviously, it's great when we can use it for creative purposes in, in movies and films, but there's also the, the possibility to abuse the technology. There are some positive benefits of it. Uh, I think that you can see people like Stephen Hawking who have some kind of disability um, or health issue that prevents them from talking normally would be able to use that kind of technology to restore their voice uh, to what they'd always known. Um, so there are certainly two sides to this. Yeah. And in terms of that, you know, we've, we've already had it with so many social media platforms. Do you think AI is going to take the possibility of faking and, you know, spreading misinformation to another level? Yeah, so I want you to imagine a world where we have social media just like today and we have the echo chambers of social media where people's quite extreme views can be amplified and reinforced. And now imagine if a politician came into your computer, came onto your phone and gave you a very personalised one-on-one -on -one speech and message. So we now have that technology where a personalised message from a politician could be delivered to every individual. So I think that that creates a risk where uh, we, we, we stand to gain uh, even more of an echo chamber on social media. And I think that we need some kind of recognition of uh, whether you are watching a deep fake video or not. I think a lot of people will stand to be tricked watching a video of a person and not knowing whether it's real. And, and to be able to be sucked in um, into the same kind of extremist views that we already see on social media and that, that effect will be amplified. Um, it, it does create new opportunities for social media companies in terms of interactions. Um, and uh, certainly there's already some very strange things happening uh, with a service called Replica. So Replica created chatbots that allowed people to form companionship. They would talk to them. They would form friendships with them and even um, some sexual uh, relationship with these um, AI bots. And the company that created it felt that this had gone a bit too far. And so they, they, they stood to uh, turn these bots off because they couldn't be certain that miners weren't using the chatbots. Um, however, when they did this, the people who had been using the service cried out and said that people had killed their companions. It was uh, quite dramatic and it was very similar to the movie Her, yeah. uh, if your viewers have seen that. Yes, I do remember it and it came straight to mind when you talked about it. You know, we were joking at the start about replacing um, presenters, replacing all sorts of people. Initially, I guess it was thought that industries that could be impacted would be physical labours, robots replacing people to do um, jobs. Is that turning out to be the case? No, so everyone's view on this, uh, including the experts and the people making the technology, 
was that artificial intelligence would come in and start replacing jobs on the factory floor. Um, uh, some of these more blue collar jobs, this is where we thought that AI would have the, the biggest impact, but the absolute reverse has happened. No one expected artists, writers, musicians, uh, graphic designers to be impacted in the way they have been first. And so any kind of creative industry or knowledge industry, which involves people working, thinking hard in front of a computer, um, these are the types of roles which are likely to be disrupted uh, going forward. I, I think that we'll see, it's a long time before we have a kind of domestic robot helper in the house, uh, but in terms of a doctor or a GP using artificial intelligence to help them make diagnosis, uh, will be there very soon. And particularly in education, I really hope we see some of the positive use cases of the technology. Uh, I've been pushing for a tutor for every child. We can really revolutionise the classroom model by uh, using this AI technology to help our children learn regard regardless of their strengths and weaknesses for particular topics. So I think that's a very exciting use case for AI. But more as a supplementary um, role to teachers, not in replacing teachers. No, absolutely not. So teachers are absolutely indispensable. I had some amazing teachers growing up. They were really inspirational to me and they actually helped me set me on the path that I, uh, that I eventually took. So I'm thinking more of what if a teacher had 30 virtual um, assistants, AI assistants, to help students uh, do their work, adjust you know, to each student's individual uh, needs, and really just um, to help guide them on their educational journey. So absolutely, we are not looking um, that there's gonna be replacements for teachers and doctors, but more that we can amplify their productivity uh, in the workplace. And certainly we'll see a number of jobs um, being changed, new jobs being created. But I think certainly in the education space, uh, this just stands to benefit students in particular. Yeah. So in terms of that trade-off, you hear figures of around, you know, a million jobs being lost as a consequence of AI. Do you think there will be a trade-off as many jobs will be created as lost? So every time we've had a, a technological revolution in the past, we have seen significant uh, jobs disrupted and no longer needed and whole new industries created. So my whole line of work didn't exist 20 to 25 years ago and now employs tens of thousands of people just in the state. So I really expect that we'll see new types of jobs, uh, new ways for humans to be productive. And we have always found things to do. Humans have always found things to do. I don't think that we're going to be bored anytime soon. But I think that it's appropriate to think of this in the same way as the invention of the computer, the invention of the internet and the invention of the mobile phone. That's the kind of level of disruption that we'll see in our society uh, and even more so perhaps. All right. Uh, good to have you on. Thank you so much for taking us through all of that. Thank you so much, Beth.